to presentation for um, this session is about contrast and the statistical inference. So I'm starting right off where um, Nadej presented the GLM. So I'll be focusing really on the right part of the pipeline that Guillaume introduced early on, except for the random field theory part here. But it's heavily linked or relying on what uh, Nadej just presented on the GLM part. So to summarize, what, what we're dealing with is uh, the so-called mass univariate approach. So if we have a list of images here, if you have a fMRI time series, what we are looking at is really the signal at a single um, voxel in the brain. And, and then we, we, we record the signal over time. Then that signal gets modeled, as Nadej just explained. And to model it, we try to capture the uh, slowly varying uh, oscillations, so the low frequencies. And we provide regressors from a model here that was the uh, block design for the stimuli here, the um, movement parameters. So we we build that. that that's you, the, the researchers, who are um, really putting in your information and, and building that model. Now, the key thing is that once the model is um, defined, so the model will be defined by its design matrix and the assumptions we make about the residuals, about the unexplained variance we, we leave in the signal, then with those two, we can estimate uh, the parameters, that is the value we should weigh each column of the design matrix in order to better uh, to, to fit our, our data. And for example, here, that would be the values for, for those numbers, beta one till um, beta eight. The last one here being simply uh, the mean of, of the signal and, and the rest is capturing some uh, variability. And from that, because we are in the um, statistical world, we also have oh, um, a part that is the unexplained signal that should be sort of the random part, the wobbling that is uh, left in the signal after fitting our model. And that's considered, uh, that's the residuals. And, and because of that, we know that what we are um, uh, estimating, so the parameters are actually also a, um, random variable so they they are distributed around their true value but then this this the estimates will will be kind of dependent on the variability of of that of those uh, residuals so the sigma square here is derived from the um, residual so how much is my signal noise uh, wobbling how widely it's wobbling and and the design that we are uh, using will also influence how well we can estimate those parameters. So nothing new here under the sun. Now, the thing is, a uh, key question we want to do is, how do we um, interrogate after this model fitting? We've acquired the data, we, we model the data, and we get a parameter estimate. How can we interrogate our model and, and make sense of the, the values that we are obtaining? So in a way, we can say that this series of roughly 100 time points has been um, summarized by uh, those eight numbers, beta one till beta eight, plus also the um, the sigma square that would be the variability of the uh, unexplained variance. Now, to look at the bits that we are interested in, um, because as I said, the, the design is something you define. I don't know in advance, no one developed SPMU in advance, what will be um, defined in, in the model. The scheme is to, and, and that's an example of a more complicated model there, you have only one condition of interest. Here you have really multiple conditions, different types of, of stimuli and, and the movement parameters as before. So the, the key point here is that we will define a so-called contrast that will point or select, if you want, the effect of interest. And that contrast, by definition, this is this is how it works. 
is um, to look at the linear combination of the regression coefficients beta. So on top of each column, we, we've got a, a beta one, a beta, and we want to look at the linear combination. And that combination is defined by this vector C, that is the contrast. So for example, if you want to look at, oh, what is the, my, my effect of interest is the response to the first condition, then it's pretty much, I'm interested in beta one, but not in the other ones. So well, they, I want to look at one time beta one and zero times all the others. And that's exactly how you can put it. I mean, seems obvious, why do that? Well, within the same framework, we can now look at a differential effect say between condition two, beta two, and condition three here uh, summarized by beta three. And you want to look at the difference between those two conditions. So here, what you want is zero times beta one, one time beta two minus one time beta three plus zero times all the other betas. In order to really focus on your effect of interest, that's the, con the difference between condition Two and condition three. I don't know what's in the design. Say that the emotional stimulus versus the neutral stimulus. So you want to look at the more of the emotional response if you want. So this is a definition, and that's that's very convenient because for whatever the design, then uh, SPM machinery can handle the the contrast, and that's again really don't use to define that, that contrast according to the question that you have. So the contrast is really a way of expressing the effect that you are interested in. And that, that's a critical uh, point. And that's really something you should define even before you acquire your data. It's what will be the GLM, the matrix that will model your data, and the contrast that will allow you to interrogate and, and use that design um, matrix. So that's, that's, that's really before doing acquiring any data, that's something you must be um, defining. Now, how do we make sense of those um, numbers? Oh yeah, and, and of course, because the betas are distributed um, according here to a normal distribution, the contrast will also be interpretable in, in the sense of a random variable. So you'll, you'll have the true effect. So what we're observing is, is close to the true effect with some um, variability that is dependent still on the sigma square that I mentioned earlier. That's the variance of your residuals, the design matrix, and the contrast that, that you are using. So the, the, the key question, so this is how you define your effect of interest. Now, the key question is, how do we know that uh, the effect is um, significant? And I mean, if we look back at this slide, we said we see that the beta one here is 3.98. So let, let's say we round it up to four. Is four a big number? Is, is four significant? Well, I mean, in, in absolute term, if I just tell you is four a big number, well, you can't tell me. And, and that's the whole point of the um, inference part is to look at the effect size. So here, for example, the beta one, if we use that, 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 up, that contrast, is my beta one large compared to something? And the, the something will, will be the variability of the signal. So we need to build um, uh, to account for the variance we, we have in the data, and that comes from the residual. So effectively, what we will do for this hypothesis testing is we construct a test statistics um, that will be a T value. And we, we start by uh, assuming that there is no effect. So we define the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis will be, well, no, there is no effect. My, my beta is not that significantly, that's, that's not so large, so it's not significant. There is nothing happening there. All I'm observing, it's just a random variation due to noise in my data. And of course, the, the bit that we are interested in, interested in is the alternative hypothesis. So we seek to um, control or, or find a way to reject the null hypothesis in order to conclude in favor of the alternative hypothesis. So if we're confident that 
saying that there is no effect is wrong, then we can say that that um, that they, 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 there is there is a an effect, a likely effect happening. Um, and the idea, the, the overall idea is that we will look at the T statistics. Well, there is another one I'll talk about uh, later on. So the the test statistic will summarize the evidence about the the null hypothesis. So typically, so here in the middle, uh, that's that's the wrong um, zero. Um, it will be interpreted in the sense that if this test statistic is small, so close to zero, then um, uh, then then the hypothesis, the null hypothesis, is is true. But then, if we are in the tail of the distribution, so if we observe large values, then we have some evidence against the the null hypothesis. So then that, 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 that the idea is, where do we put the threshold in order to control this uh, sense of small or small, that is null hypothesis, um, and uh, is true and um, large value, um, the null hypothesis is false and should be um, rejected. And um, that is what we, we can do if, if we know the distribution of this uh, uh, null distribution of the t value, the the idea is that if we fix the threshold, that's the one that I'm, I'm saying. So that's where do I decide that the null hypothesis is, is false or, 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 or we, we accept it? Then it, it's based on a threshold u alpha that, that we need to fix. And for each threshold u alpha, you will have a what's remaining in in the tail that's um the false positive rate so if there is really just noise in my signal then i fix a threshold u alpha so under the null so there is only noise in my data the probability so fixing a threshold u alpha so that is probability of finding um, a value t bigger than that threshold will entail a false positive risk of so much alpha. So what we obviously want to do is, is work the other way around. We will fix in advance our alpha, so say 0.05 or 0.001, one in 1,000. And, and with that fixed probability, that's something we can interpret. Then given that uh, we know about the null distribution we're dealing with, we we can derive the threshold that is to be that should be used to decide if there is a significant effect or no significant effect in in the data that in the parameter that we are interested in and that's that's exactly what what's happening so the point is we we can decide that in advance as long as we know the shape of this null distribution so pretty much it it's width then then decide on the um false positive rates we 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 accept to take then we we fix we can derive a threshold then when we observe some data we can conclude and we can we take we can we can reject or not reject the null hypothesis so if we observe something that is larger than the threshold that we have fixed then we can reject the null hypothesis and conclude that there is an effect if not we cannot conclude we just say we the data are either too noisy for, for the effect or, or maybe there is really no effect. We, we, we cannot conclude um, in, in that situation. And, and the p-value that would be associated with a t that comes from one of our observation, that's the evidence against the null hypothesis. So the uh, t that we, we get will, will lead to a p-value and the p-value, the larger the small t, um, the the smaller the p-value. So here, the, that that's uh, the understanding is the the meaning of that is that the p-value is the chance of observing a value more extreme than the one we we have at hand under the null hypothesis. So that's that's the interpretation. So it's not the probability of having an effect 
that the probability of observing such an extreme value or such a large effect by chance if there is nothing in my data if there is only noise in my data so that's that the idea that's that's how we proceed for uh, this classical inference and um so back to my um practical example um the idea with this design where we have a simple uh, auditory stimulation of course it, it's the first regressor we're interested in that's the one that I correctly the parameter beta one was something like 3.8 or, or, or so and and we want to know if it's large or not in order to reject the, the null hypothesis to do that that means that we build a contrast and as I explained, we are only uh, interested in beta one, so we put one followed by zeros. And the null hypothesis is that effectively beta one is, is sort of close to zero. I mean, it's not exactly zero because there is noise in my data, so the, the, the value would be uh, some random number close to zero. So that, that would be my, my null hypothesis, and that's what I would want to recheck if there is truly an effect. And to do that, we, we can build this um, test statistic. So we take the contrast of the estimated parameters, C transposed beta, and uh, over its standard deviation. So the variance of the estimate. So that's what we, we had uh, showed you early on. It depends on the residuals of my, uh, so the unexplained variance in my data. After I have applied the model, given the contrast that I'm um, interested in here. So for each voxel, I can calculate that T value because I have all, all the elements. And then um, with that, I'll be able to threshold things. So effectively what's happening under the hood in, in SPM, when, when you fit the model, so that's uh, fitting the GLM, Given some data, you will estimate a parameter beta at each and every voxel in, in the brain, at least in every bit that's inside the, the brain mask. You can look at the bits, the residual um, mean square image. So that is the variance you, you have at each signal. So for example, here, you see that the model doesn't really capture the signal in the ventricles, which is not surprising because ventricles have a signal that will be sort of kind of noisy but and, and variable but um, completely unrelated to the task that the subject is performing when we decide to build the contrast that will simply take a linear combination of the, the beta maps and and create a single uh, contrast image so that the calculation is done at each and every voxel and then we can kind of take the ratio of those two and get the SPMT and, and here you already put um, places where you have largish um, T values they are the, the bright parts here and that are located close to the um, auditory uh, areas uh, over the auditory areas um, actually so this passive word listening versus rest is about, is there activation during listening? We define the null hypothesis, beta one is zero, nothing is happening. We build the contrast to test that null hypothesis. We build the T value, the T maps, and then we can with this um, define a alpha of 0 0.001 which corresponds for the number of degrees of freedom we are dealing with uh, here with the data to a T value of 3.2 or so. So if we take the previous image, the SPMT maps that I showed you, you sort of make everything that is below this threshold transparent and everything that is uh, above the threshold uh, shows up here in, in, in red to, to white, yellow, white, then, then you can overlap and, and show where you have voxels that have a parameter value that is extreme and unlikely to have occurred if there was really no effect and just noise over there. So this is showing you each and every voxel that has a um, 
a beta value that is surprisingly large. And so where you would you could in in, in principle reject the null hypothesis. So here, um, well, you'll see that in the in the demos and the, the hands-on um, later on today and, and in the, the following days that um, you you summarize things by having SPM provides the location three three peaks per cluster, and so the highest value, the highest t value, is thirteen point ninety four, which corresponds to a p value that is so small that it, it can't be um, uh, represented clearly. I mean, there are so many zeros; it's very small. So this is um, the first um, inference you can make. Um, just to prime you for uh, something that will come next, that's the multiple comparison um, issue. So all this inference is based on the single voxel. So it's done um, one voxel at a time, if you want. And, and this calculation doesn't know if you have one voxel, 100 voxels, or 100,000 voxels. The key point here is that what we how we threshold the image is we accept to be wrong literally every one in one thousand inference that we are performing so if you have a single voxel you you just do one experiment you acquire a single voxel in the brain and you have a nice um, experiment you have your statistics and and it's all fine now of course we're dealing with images that has say 100,000 voxels because that's an image by nature, we have so many voxels. Now, if we threshold at one in 1000, well, you understand that immediately that on average, you would expect that 100 voxels would, would show something um, by chance um, that is so, ex that is um, deemed significant while it's actually just a random signal over there. So that's the problem is when we, make the interpretation for the whole brain to account for the, the number of voxels, we need to do something more. And that's that's what will be tackled later on. So, but uh, in terms of calculation here, that's, that's still purely valid if you were focusing on that single voxel alone. A multiple comparison will be addressed, uh, I believe, later on, today or tomorrow. Now, to summarize, a uh, t-test is um, a signal to noise measure. Why so? Well, it, it boils down to this. We we have some signal here. That's our effect of interest over its standard de deviation. So this is a signal to noise ratio. So that's um, giving you um, a value large either if when when the effect is relatively large compared to the uh, to the noise. So it's not a effect size indicator. You can have a very small effect, but an even smaller um, standard deviation that would still lead to a very large t value. Conversely, you could have a very large effect, but that is uh, comes from very noisy data that leads to a um, small t value. So we still have to be careful when interpreting the t values. Keep in mind signal to noise uh, measure. Um, what we are testing, uh, we, we assume here that the null hypothesis, the beta is zero, and the alternative in SPM by default is that we are looking for positive effects. That is, we're looking for beta, um, C transpose beta bigger than zero. So if we put a one followed by zeros, that would be testing beta one bigger than zero. So if we wanted to test for beta one smaller than zero, a deactivation or, or then, then you simply you need to adjust the signs you put in the contrast. So the contrast can be made of ones, but also of minus one, and and any combination is possible as long as the effect that you're interested in is um, expressed uh, here by by this contrast, and that we are we are um, testing this C transpose beta bigger than than zero. Um, yeah, uh, the T contrast, yeah, it's the combination of, uh, so the contrast itself is the linear combination of, of the, the betas. Um, 
and the, but the, still the key statistics does not depend on the scaling of the regressors or the scaling of the contrast. What it means is that if I'm testing one time beta one, I would get the same. I will get the same results if, if I test ten times beta one. For obvious reasons, um, you cannot change the um, statistical inference by just changing the scaling of of your contrast or of your um, of your measured so that's for sharing um why is it well simply the um the scaling effect in terms of the model uh and the, that's the regressors and the betas is because the 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 model appears here at the, in the denominator and the beta appear here at, at the top so we can use in a way um different units in our model the beta will be unit dependent, of course, but the T, because of the ratio, it's um, um, it doesn't have any units if you want, and therefore it, it's not affected by the by the scaling. And and the same goes for the contrast. So the C um, vector appears both at the numerator and denominator. Here it's under the square root, so it's not a problem if it appears twice, and therefore the ratio is uh, scale independent. So that means that if we, um, for example, we want to take the uh, mean or the sum of the effects across multiple sessions from one single subject, we can, for example, just put a, a C here, and that will give me uh, the sum of the effects of beta one for session one, beta one for session two, beta one session three, beta one for session four. Now, where it gets a bit um, dangerous or, or um, risky um, is that this this contrast is is of course dependent on the scaling. That is, if if I I say I want to have um, one beta one or ten times beta one, of course that value will be one beta one or ten times beta one will will have a different. Um, scale and and it, it can be an issue for example in in this particular case where uh, some subjects have four sessions and some subjects have only three sessions so if if we just put one 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 for everyone here you would have the sum of uh, four values of beta so if all the betas are around four as if as it was for um the uh, example we had well, here, four plus four plus four plus four is equal to 12, while here, three plus three plus three is equal, oh, sorry, four, 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 four is equal to 16, and here it's 12. So you would have an issue here because you cannot compare the sum of the betas for subject with four sessions and some of the betas for subjects with three sessions. And the key idea is that here you need to account for the scale. And so if you really want to look at the mean effect across your um, different sessions you have to account for the number of sessions because four plus four plus four plus four divided by four that will give me four 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 divided by three that's four again and now we make those subjects um, comparable and that's especially important because as you will see later on again today or tomorrow um, for the random effect analysis we use these contrast images, those C transpose beta. That's that's the um, summary image that is brought to the second level where we'll be comparing or analyzing um, signal uh, effect across the multiple subject. Um, so that, that's the principle for T statistics. Um, another type of test that can be performed in SPM is um, the F test or the extra sum of square principles. And overall, this boils down to model comparison. So, what do we mean with that? Well, imagine that you have come up with the design matrix that is a bit more complex, has these two conditions, those regressors, and then discussing with your colleague or your supervisor, your boss, um, people are arguing that effectively some part of your design is useless. 
doesn't capture any um, variability. So you can see it as useless, or you, uh, you can think of it as asking yourself, is, is this part capturing something important in, in my signal? Um, so what we want to do in a way is, is compare the full model with the reduced model by assessing how much variance is captured by this handful of regressors. And, and we want to test all of them together. We don't want to test beta 4, then beta 5, then beta 6. We want to see if these beta 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, pulled together are useful or capturing um, some signal. And that's, that's a totally valid question you can have. And to do that, well, we, we can look at the um, uh, residuals from each model. So, yeah, sorry, should have defined the null hypothesis here will be that the reduced model is, is the one that should be employed. That is, if one, this part of the design doesn't capture anything um, relevant, useful. And the idea is that we can look at how much um, unexplained signal, unexplained variance remains. When we fit the full model, there is this residual sum of squares. So the sum, so that's the variance of, 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 of the noise, if you want. Um, for the full model, we'll, we'll have some value that I'll call RSS. Now, if we use the reduced model, we'll have RSS zero for, for reduce. And something, if you look at these two, pretty much the idea is how different are those two numbers? Um, this one, uh, so RSS, sorry, RSS zero will always be larger or equal than this one. When would those two numbers be exactly the same? So the difference be the same? Well, if X1 is really capturing absolutely nothing in the signal, then um, the residual, the remaining um, signal after fitting the model will be the same for the full and the reduced model. So those two numbers will be the same. The moment X1 can capture a bit of the signal, then there'll be less uh, residual. So that number RSS will be smaller than that one. So that difference tells us how much signal is captured by this uh, part of the design matrix. And, and it's the same question again, that difference, is it big or small? Big, that means significant, small, that means irrelevant or, um, not, uh, or, or rather not significant. And that can be estimated through an F-test. And to do that, we'll, we'll use the test statistic that will be the ratio of the difference between those two numbers. And as I said, RSS zero is always bigger than or equal to RSS uh, for the full model. So that number is um, positive. That's called the extra sum of square. And then we, we sort of scale it by the residual, the, yes, the, um, variance coming from the full model and again we we get some ratio and those that ratio is distributed according to a um, f distribution with two different degrees of freedom that is i mean mathematically we we take the the difference of the ranks between those two matrices intuitively that means how many columns are we considering here uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. So uh, here, the first degree of freedom will be uh, six, because that's nine minus three. And then the second one will be how many um, degrees of freedom, a bit like in the t-test, depends on the number of samples minus the number of parameters that we are um, estimating. Let's say that's the intuition. Mathematically, we need to use the rank of the matrix because of uh, some uh, math mathematical issues with collinearity, with regressors, and this and that. But that's that's the that's the idea. And so, to that that's the principle. And to perform that test, we can again use the um, idea of uh, testing a contrast. So we we again, in terms of machinery, we'll use a contrast. Um, 
so when we say that the true model is is uh, the reduced model, that's our null hypothesis. That implicitly uh, means that what we are uh, assuming for the null hypothesis is that beta four till beta nine are all equal to zero. That's 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 the null hypothesis. That that's what we want to reject. So effectively, we want to test beta four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, to see if they are um, equal to uh, zero or close to zero. And to do that, we will use a multilinear uh, uh, multi um, contrast because we want to test each um, parameter within the same test, but we don't want to combine them in this case. We want to check beta four to zero, beta five to zero, beta six, beta seven, eight, nine, is it equal to zero? So here the contrast will use multiple lines, one per beta that we are um, evaluating or assessing. And that will be simply represented as, as a matrix in the um, SPM, SPM uh, GUI. And under the hood, again, starting with the SPM, um, estimated model, what will happen is when you define that such a contrast and you tell SPM, no, 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 I want you to do a NEF test and I put this uh, multi-line contrast, then from the estimated uh, model, it will um, calculate, estimate the extra sum of square image and um, derive this um, SPM F uh, map from which again we'll be able to threshold uh, for to reject the null hypothesis so if we we get back to our um, simple example of um, the experiment with the auditory stimulation the movement parameters we uh, if when we apply this contrast then we can threshold on pom 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 it's not showed here but it's, uh, I assume it's a 0.001 um, uncorrected. <clears throat> then, then that shows you all the parts of the brain where there is some part of the signal that correlates with the movement parameters. And it's quite extensive. And it's not surprising to see the bits that are really at the edge of the brain. Um, why is it so? Well, imagine that whenever the subject is moving then a voxel in i mean the scanner is not moving it's the subject moving in the scanner so that voxel the signal will will change with the head movement and sometimes it's in the brain or well, high signal sometimes it's outside uh, the brain low signal so that signal variation is uh, likely especially at the edge of the brain um to, to be uh, correlated with, with the movement, the translation and or um, rotation. And so to summarize, um, F-test, well, we, we see this as, as I mentioned, to test for the additional variance uh, explained within a larger model or vice versa is, is my large model um, really necessary or can I use a smaller nested model so this is this model comparison but they are not completely independent it's always a, a, a smaller model within a larger one um, we can interpret uh, the the test that I was uh, showing where we're testing beta 4 equal to 0 beta 5 equal to 0 and so on as uh, testing for the sum of square of several combination of the, the betas. Testing for beta 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 equal to 0 is equivalent to testing for beta 4 squared plus beta 5 squared plus beta 6 squared plus 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 beta 9 squared equal to 0. Um, in practice also, it's not always it's not necessary to explicitly separate uh, your uh, design matrix i mean when we build a design matrix we don't have to split it uh, that way it's it's really down to the contrast 
that gives us the flexibility to combine any sets of columns in our design matrix in terms of um, F test. Um, so the interpretation um, of, of the F test, so as I said, we're testing for multiple betas at the same time. The alternative hypothesis, so when we see something significant, as, as we see here with all the, the red parts in the brain, I can't tell which of my stick movement parameters is actually capturing most of the variance. So maybe it's only the translation that is important in this voxel. Maybe it's only the, um, uh, the, the, the pitch rotation in another part of the brain. I can't tell because effectively, the null hypothesis is that there is nothing, no, no effect in the betas that I'm, I'm targeting, but the alternative is that there is at least one of the betas where you have um, an effect. So it's sort of increasing um, your sensitivity. So you test for all the betas pulled together, but you lose a bit in specificity because you don't know which of the betas is sort of is is, uh, is driving your your effect. Um, to do to know what which beta is is uh, relevant is important. That's where you need to go deeper and explore your, your results to, to, to look at which of, for example, among beta one, two, and three, which one is actually different from uh, zero. Could be all of them. Beta one can be positive, beta two can be negative, and beta three can be really close to zero. That's, that I can't tell by um, checking my, my test. Um, and because also we are, um, doing an, uh, this F test, we can actually look also look at the difference between two conditions. So I could look at the difference beta, be, between beta one and beta two. So I can look at the difference between condition one and condition two within the framework of an F test. The key thing here, the interpretation is, are we, we looking for any difference between those two conditions? In other words, in terms of model representation is, was it necessary to represent those two conditions as separate conditions, or could it, could it have been modeled as a single condition? So that's that's the interpretation in terms of a complex model and reduced model. And, and because of that, if you test for beta one minus beta two, it will be exactly, it will give you the same result as testing for beta two minus beta one, because we, we are testing for, for um, um, any directions we're testing for an effect that is different from, from zero, be it positive or um, negative. So that's the F-test. Um, so that, that's the two tools we have in SPM, T-test and F-test, um, to, um, to, uh, to make inference about the effects we have of interest. So last topic I want to cover is the issue of regressors uh, orthogonality. Um, this is a kind of Venn diagram. So you can say that this is all the variance we have in, in our signal. So now we, we, we can simply look at, um, uh, at the single voxel, the time course, and that's that's the variability of my, my signal. And then we can look at our uh, design matrix and we can split it in, in two parts. So that could be, for example, my conditions, the stuff that I, I ask my subject to perform, my sense stimuli, and the, this, for example, can be the movement parameters. If the uh, regressors are orthogonal, that means that they are not um, sharing any variability or, or they cannot explain um, one, the variability as explained by one is not overlapping the variability explained by the other one. So we can say that the, those two uh, disks are completely um, disjoint. When I test for X1, so the first part of the, the design, my effect of interest, I'll see whatever is related uh, to, that, to those effects. And, and vice versa, I can look at maybe where I have things related to uh, the uh, part of the design X2. No, things are not that clear cut in, in general. And, and we have typically 
some shared variance between sets of regressors. As I said, it can be my effects of interest and movement parameters, or can be some of my uh, conditions with another bunch of other conditions. That's especially the case when you're using fast designs, event related stuff, but something that will be covered um, later on again. So th the point here is that both parts of my design can explain um, some of the variability, and that's this uh, shared variance. What is critical to keep in mind when we do uh, an inference is that when we test for x1, so that's my effect of interest, yeah, it, it's slightly collated with the other part of the design, but I'm, I'm not interested in that part of the design. Then what you are testing is for the additional uh, variant. So that is, we are testing for whatever can be explained by x1 that is not already covered by or explained by um, x2. Now, conversely, if I want to test for the other part of the design, I will only test for the additional variability brought in by x2 after accounting for x1. So you can see it as here, you regress out everything that can be explained by X1, and then you use what's left over and, and fit the, the part X2 of your, of your design. In other words, we never test for the shared variance here in, in, in the middle. So that can be a, an issue if, well, if there is not too much overlap, we, we, you still have enough signal uh, to to make your inference no the danger is when some bits of your some parts of your design are really uh, collated so they are very linear and, and i'm not talking just just two columns it's it's the whole set of of columns in the two parts of your design that can be um collinear and in that case testing for one will lead to very few very little um effect because sort of the signal here the bits that you're interested in x1 is all eaten up by x2 and and vice versa if you want to look for what x2 can capture well everything has been um, eaten up by um, x1 so uh, one way out is to test for the joint effect of x1 and x2 that, that would be testing for both put together so that would be so sort of some um, F-test, but that, that's not always um, practical, especially as I think John mentioned it, if, if X2 is your movement parameters and X1 is your um, visual stimuli, then you, you, you are a bit annoyed because what you would be reporting can be due to the neuronal response to your visual stimuli or to the head movement in the scanner. One is of interest, the other one is of no interest, and, and therefore that would be um, annoying. Um, and so that's why uh, within SPM, that's that's again a kind of a complicated um, evoked response design where you have one, two, three, four conditions, and each condition is, is modeled in a complicated way. That's the movement parameters. And this is the design orthogonality will show you the collinearity you have between any pair of columns here. That's why you have this big matrix. And here you see that movement parameters are fairly collinear. I mean, that's not surprising. I mean, the head is moving and translation and rotation because of uh, the head movement is constrained, they are collated. But the good thing is those movement parameters are not collated or collated only a little with um, the conditions that are, or the regressors for my conditions, which is the bit that I'm interested in. Among my conditions here, there is some collation and I'll have to live with that. And that's likely due to, I mean, the timing of your experiment. And, and sometimes, I mean, you have events occurring right up, one after the other, and, and that leads to this collinearity. Um, so that's worth uh, checking again before you acquire your data. You can build those matrices and you can check uh, at least between your conditions that you are not messing up your um, 
the collation and therefore the orthogonality of your of your design and ensure that you can actually extract the contrast the effect that you are interested in there is um so the uh, summary is that when there is collation we test for the additional effect only so that will be that means that there is some implicit orthogonalization so if if we look at this in terms of vectors i mean um, for some people vectors are easier to understand um, for others vectors are more complicated so here say you have two regressors that are pointing in two directions in in a very large space and and they represent the what can be captured by one part of the design and, and another part of the design matrix so when we test for x1 that will be capturing um not just what is uh, explained by x1 but what is explained by x1 orthogonally compared to x2 and then when we test for x2 that will be the bit of x2 that is orthogonal to x1 so that's the implicit orthogonalization uh, due to uh, the tests that are performed um orthogonalization means decorrelation so sometimes it especially at the second level when you have multiple regressors it may be useful to orthogonalize one regressor with the other it's it's not a perfect solution it, it actually rarely solves the problem at heart if if you have a collation between your regressors but this is the way to to, to deal with it so that's down to you to um uh take the measures that are appropriate to answer the question that you have and if you have multiple regressors or multiple conditions that are uh, really collated then then the f-test at least can show you what is captured by this set of regressors in your uh, design matrix uh yeah and last word here is um the or the regressors in your design are not exactly what matters what matters is the contrast so of course if you're testing for single column so you put a one and, and zeros then that's easy because you are looking at the collation between that regressor and the rest of your design matrix and that's something you can obviously um, check using this um, design orthogonality graph now what what happens is if you compare two conditions, as, as I use as an example early on, condition two versus condition three, what matters is how is the difference between those two regressors collated with the rest of your design matrix? And that's not something that is um, easy to see um, um, well on, on the orthogonality um, uh, graph, but that's something you may want to control as well um, if you have uh, problems or, or if you want to make sure that you don't get problems with your design matrix with your um, data acquisition and the analysis uh, later on and with it um, I'm done and there are some references I mean uh, dating back to the last century or oh, well no you we still have some papers from the early 2000s Thank you.